It is 1 p.m. in Damascus. It is 6 a.m. in Tampa, Florida. I'm Juanita Rajpal. This is World One, live from London. The United Nations is paralyzed over the escalating crisis in Syria. Diplomats at the Security Council are searching for a breakthrough today. Tuesday, they failed to agree on a draft resolution that calls for Syria's president, Bashar al-Assad, to well, step we down. See what newspapers around the world are writing about this, starting with The Guardian here in Britain with this headline, Soviet hangover turned headache. It's a comment piece that says Moscow has to address two questions as it prepares to wield its veto. First, as Assad's principal arms supplier, is it backing the loser? The second question is more pressing. Is it about to lose its last ally in a newly democratic democratized Arab world of which Syria will remain a vital hub whatever happens. In the United Arab Emirates, the Nationals headline is struggle to get Russia on board for Syria plan. The article says some see it as a last grasp at the embers of Soviet era influence in the Middle East. One question facing diplomats is whether Russia might be willing to cut off Mr. Al-Assad if it could maintain its arms contracts and other arrangements with a successor government. And finally, the headline and the Oman Daily Observer is global power politics in the Middle East and it's the editorial that goes on to say with both Moscow and Beijing facing an uptick in protest on their own territory in the last year neither has any desire to watch another leader dragged from office more now on a story that many of you will find disturbing. Killings and murders have been going on for the better part of a year in Syria. As we've reported the story, we've been careful about what we show you. Today, we're showing you images that are far more graphic than we've previously shown. But CNN believes it is necessary to demonstrate the brutality of this crackdown and its effects on innocent families. This is Arwa Damon's report. In the US presidential race, Republican voters in the state of Florida have spoken, and now it is the candidates who won't stop talking. They're all putting their own spin on the results of Tuesday's primary, which looked like this. Mitt Romney won the Sunshine State with almost half the voters, well ahead of Newt Gingrich, who got 32 percent. Rick Santorum and Ron Paul brought up the rear. We want to get more now on the winner-take-all primary. CNN contributor John Avalon joins us now from New York. John, thanks for being with us. So, I mean, is it inevitable that Mitt Romney is going to take it all the way to the convention in, uh, in, in August and he is going to be the one that Barack Obama is going to face? Nothing is inevitable in American politics, but there's no question Mitt Romney's in the poll position. Last night it was a decisive victory in yeah, Florida. Yeah, we're all looking for that one single billionaire there, John. Thank you so much for that, John Avalon there in New York. Now, Iowa, New Hampshire, and South Carolina, the first three states to hold primaries, have one thing in common. They are sparsely populated and predominantly white. But as Jonathan Mann explains, Florida is the very opposite. Florida is America's fourth most populous state and one of the most ethnically diverse. That has Man there, now it's the southern part of the state that is mostly ethnically diverse. That's where much of Florida's Hispanic population lives. And Jonathan Mann spoke to the analyst, uh, to our analyst Bill Schneider, uh, from The Third Way, which calls itself a politically moderate think tank. And he asked him how that ethnic mix affected the voting. It really didn't. Uh, because everybody voted for Mitt Romney over Newt Gingrich. The only good I'm talking to Bill Schneider there. Minus 27 degrees Celsius. That was the temperature in Bucharest, Romania, before sunrise this Wednesday. An extreme cold snap has killed at least 50 people across Europe, 30 of them in Ukraine. Emergency services say many of those uh, people died because they Most were of Europe is either buried under snow or shivering amid Arctic temperatures. Meteorologist Mari Ramos is at the World Weather Center with all the details, and I'm hearing that it's uh, not going to end anytime soon, Mari. No, not anytime soon at all, Monita. The Minus 27 that you mentioned there for Bucharest. That's uh, very significant because when you think about it, their average low temperature. Time to brace ourselves there, Mari. Thank you so much for that. This is World One Live from London when we return. The Pakistani military says its jets launched an, uh, a raid on Taliban bases early Wednesday, killing around 30 insurgents. An official said the Air Force was gunning for Taliban hideouts in tribal areas near the Afghanistan border and claimed the attack may have killed a Taliban commander. According to the military, the raid was retaliation for a Taliban attack on a security post just a day earlier, which killed at least um, eight soldiers. Now, the Pakistani Foreign Office has denied claims its spy 
Fedai Agency is helping the Taliban in Afghanistan. The allegations apparently surfaced in a report that U.S. forces compiled for NATO. A spokesman for the Foreign Office told CNN the accusations are frivolous. Jerome Starkey is the Afghanistan correspondent for the Times newspaper. He's seen the leaked report. He joins us now with more on that. So what more does this uh, report uh, 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 have and how damning is it for the Karzai government? Well, the report is based on more than 27,000 interrogations with over 4,000 detainees, Taliban detainees, Al-Qaeda detainees. UN inspectors and Iranian officials have described their recent talks about the country's nuclear program as good. The inspectors were following up a report in which they said it looked like Iran was trying to build nuclear weapons. Well, that's certainly the belief in Israel, where politicians say any Iranian missiles would be pointed their way. CNN's David McKenzie was invited to an Israeli military demonstration where troops and tank crews put on a, a show of strength. This is the southern desert of Israel, and the Israeli defense forces are firing on this dummy village with sniper fire. The League's founder, Julian Assange, is headed to Britain's Supreme Court today in a last-ditch attempt to block his extradition to Sweden. Authorities there want to question him over allegations of sexual misconduct. He denies any wrongdoing and says the case is politically motivated. But is outside the Supreme Court in London. She joins us now. Atika, so is this it for Julian Assange? Well, it could be. It really depends. He arrived in court today looking very calm and collected. He's now uh, sitting through the uh, hearing and listening to the evidence that's being put forward uh, by his own legal team. Uh, now, basically, what it means, the fact that he is at Britain's Supreme Court, there could be two outcomes, and we don't expect a decision until several weeks from now. Really, he feels fairly confident that he's going to be able to host this uh, chat TV show for Russia TV uh, over the next few weeks before any decision is made whether or not to extradite him, Manita. What's interesting about all of this, and while all this is happening, I guess it's when it comes down to perception, the fact of the matter is uh, Julian Assange hasn't been charged with anything right now. The Swedish authorities just want him for questioning. Well, exactly, and this is a point that uh, Julian Assange and his legal team have repeatedly made. He has not been charged with anything. There are allegations uh, of sexual misconduct. Of sexual All right, uh, Atika, thank you very much for that. Atika Schubert there outside the High Court here in London. Of course, we'll bring you more on what happens there and whatever decisions made in the next day. Now, we want to go back to one of our top stories here on World One. Pakistan is denying claims contained in a leaked NATO report that Pakistani forces are directly assisting the Taliban in Afghanistan. Bring your General Carson Jacobson joins us now down the line from Kabul. He is the spokesman for the International Security Assistance Force. Sir, thank you very much uh, for being with us. Um, from, from what we understand from this leaked NATO document, does it actually reflect ISAF's assessment on the ground? Well, the document in question that was uh, your published... This is World One, the live from London. The deadline in European uh, club football passed last night just as some key games were taking place in the English Premiership. Let's get all the details from Don Riddell. Don. Thanks very much, Manita. Football's European transfer window has closed for the rest of the season now. Oh, and that looked while like fun. I could never do it, but it looked like I fun. I wish I could do that. Yeah. <laughs> Ought to be young again, Don. Thank <laughs> you so much. You're watching World One live from London. Welcome back. You are watching World One live from London. We are approaching almost 7 a.m. in New York, give it a take 10 minutes, 1 p.m. in Berlin, and it's almost 9 p.m. in Tokyo. As the rumors reach fever pitch, the world's largest social media site may be about to hold an initial public offering. Facebook is reportedly filing papers later today with the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission for an IPO that could come as soon as May. Commentators say it's looking to raise $5 billion dollars in a New York listing. Facebook is worth an estimated 75 to 100 billion dollars. Now, that's one of the stories generating a lot of interest on social media right now. Facebook users are concerned about how the social network's listing could affect their user experience. There's a fair bit of negative sentiment online. A lot of people say they feel Facebook's decision to launch an IPO is a sellout. Also causing a stir, Fred Goodwin, as we've been telling you, the former boss of the Royal Bank of Scotland has been stripped of his knighthood. On Twitter, British Labour Party leader Ed Miliband said it is right that Fred Goodwin has lost his knighthood, but it's only the start of the change we need in our boardrooms. But there are others who say Goodwin is just being used as a scapegoat. 
scapegoat, sorry, and also trending. An online campaign to boycott Apple products is gathering some steam. The New York Times recently reported on the working conditions at Chinese factories making gadgets for Apple. One website, uh, change.org, has collected 145,000 signatures from people calling on the company to do more to protect the workers. This January, CNN's been uh, keeping you up to date with the race to be uh, the Republican presidential candidate from caucuses in Iowa to Tuesday's primary in Florida. Instead of asking which candidate can carry the next state, how about which one can carry a tune? GD Most did some research. When a candidate sings, America. Well, we saw there Stephen Colbert from the, the Colbert Report. Well, he also wanted to highlight what he calls the absurdity of the so-called uh, Super PAC. That's a political action committee that is allowed to raise unlimited funds to support a candidate. So he decided to form his own Super PAC and called it Americans for a Better Tomorrow Tomorrow. But you're watching World One live from London. I'm Monita Rajpal. Thank you for joining us. Stay with us. We'll bring you more World One in just a couple of minutes.